everybody knew that ESC 2020 was memorable with the path-breaking clinical data presented from multiple global trials. This program is designed with the objective of dialogue between two different specialties, cardiology and endocrinology, which would bring upon two different ways to address the complexities of the clinical cases in heart failure. So according to April HF trial, does SGLT2 inhibitor may be considered as an important drug for heparin? And for this, let me introduce today's speakers. Yeah, today's speakers are Dr. Venkatesh and Dr. Basavraj, and I will moderate Dr. Shari. Dr. Basavraj is a considered diabetologist in Narayana Health City in Bangalore. Dr. Basavraj received several prestigious awards till date, and till now he has several national and international publications in his credit and also presented various papers in various conferences and CMEs. I welcome Dr. Basavraj in his expert webinar. Our Thank next you. profession, uh, our next, uh, sorry, uh, next speaker is Professor Venkatesh. Dr. Venkatesh is a professor, senior consultant, intervention cardiologist, Apple Hospitals in Bangalore. Doctor has published articles in many peer reviewed international journals and has won several national, national international prestigious awards till date and also renowned speaker in several national and international conferences and also a teacher for the DNB students. I welcome Dr. Venkatesh in this expert webinar. Okay, and I hand Thank over. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I will hand over the session to Dr. Vasavraj to start with the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shovik. Thank you for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you again for giving thank me you, chance, yeah. Tim Lupin, to uh, give me, uh, to again, uh, share my screen with, uh, yes. nowadays it's not diaz, share my screen with Dr. Venkatesh again on this uh, uh, very old topic, very discussed topic of uh, the hot bus, the new uh, Crown Prince digitally to inhibitors. So welcome all on a, a lazy Sunday evening. Post festivities, it would be difficult for us all to resume back to work. But however said and done that, we all are here to sharpen our skills and try to uh, learn as much as possible, both uh, all the audience, me, Dr. Shavik, Dr. Venkatesh here, to learn something out from the hour long session over here. So uh, now what we'll be to, uh, talking today will be about the SGLT2 inhibitor inhibitor, which is the empagliflozin, the mother molecule or the father molecule, which started all the discussion and the buzz is the empagliflozin. What we'll be dealing with is the multi-mechanisms, the multi-indications where all we can give and the multiple benefits which are seen along with this. So I am Dr. Basavras, so I'll be dealing with the endocrine and the diabetes perspectives of uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors. So when it comes to understanding the mechanisms of uh, how uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors work, there have been multiple postulated and also some of those are proven mechanisms which are uh, there for the SGLT2 inhibitors. As you can see in this slide, there has been decrease in the blood pressure and decrease in the arterial stiffness, which has been majorly uh, uh, given the, uh, the credit for the cardiovascular benefits. There has been also some uh, um, uh, mechanisms which have been explaining about the albuminuria, decreasing the albuminuria. Uh, SLT2 inhibitors are per se uricosuric acid, hence they decrease the uric acid levels also. They are glucosuric, causes osmotic diuresis. So hence decreases the uh, glucose levels and also the fasting insulin levels are also down. And they also decrease the sympathetic nervous system activity by a central mechanism. And hence, because of the glucosuria effect, they cause uh, uh, weight loss also. And also there's a decrease in the visceral adiposity because of the ketogenesis caused by the SL2 inhibitors. Much said and done, there have been the outer broader the circle which represents the novel pathways, which still we, which are yet to be uh, discovered and then uh, to be understood in a better way. So when we, uh, when we come to this slide, this slide gives us a very, uh, crisp idea of how uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors are beneficial and they have an improval effects and on the, uh, as compared to vis a -vis the, the heart failure, the predominantly mainstream heart failure medication. All of these medications act by four mechanisms, that is your natriuresis, the second one is improving the kidney function and the cardiorenal physiology, decreasing the preload or and, and or all the upload and the LV wall stress and also the interstitial edema. 
when it comes to SGLT2 inhibitor, it acts by all of these four mechanisms and also natri uresis and dense leading to decrease in the preload. It also improves the kidney function and also the interstitial edema. When compared to all of the other drugs, none of these other drugs acts by all the four mechanisms. Predominantly, the newer child on the block again of the ARNIs, where again ARNIs have been uh, said that it does not have any effect on the interstitial edema, whereas your SGLT2 inhibitors does have. So uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, where did this start from? SGLT2 inhibitors were discovered way back in the 1835 from uh, some French or German scientists had discovered. The fluorescein was the first compound there. And then from the bark of the apple tree, which was uh, fluorescein was uh, taken down and then it was uh, studied. But the problem with fluorescein was that it had very severe and unpleasant GI effects, number one. And number two, the effect or the selectivity of the SGL2 2 inhibitors was very low. And it used to get to convert it to other uh, metabolites which were not so very active. So it took almost as two centuries to develop the predominantly SGLT2 inhibitor acting uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. So DAPA, the first uh, molecule which got uh, published was dapagliflozin, March 2008, almost a decade back. Then remogliflozin, canagliflozin, and then empagliflozin. So the CDE has got a uh, minimum of 19 publications with uh, patients or almost around 500 patients each. So this is the mechanism uh, depicting how the SGLT2 inhibitor acts. So the renal threshold of glucose of 180 milligram per deciliter is being utilized here in this uh, in the action of SGLT2 inhibitors. When the level of the blood glucose levels goes to more than 180, 180 uh, grams per day, filter load of glucose grows more than 180 grams per day, then uh, the uh, glucose gets filtered out. So normally also, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors tend to reabsorb this sodium. So this SGLT2 inhibitors block this SGLT2 specifically, and then SGLT1, yes, they do enhance uh, or reabsorb some of these uh, uh, glucose molecules, but the predominant action is by SGLT2 inhibitor. So when we block this SGLT2 inhibitor, there is predominant glucosuria, which causes urinary glucose excretion and osmotic diuresis, which forms the main state of uh, uh, the mechanism for its uh, efficacy in diabetes mellitus. So when it comes to comparison of the pharmacological properties of the three main FDA approved SGLT2 inhibitors, the empagliflozin, dapagliflozin, or the canagliflozin, so these are the head-to-head -head comparison in the form of a tabular column. So the therapeutic doses, as we all know, empagliflozin is 10 or 25 milligrams, DAPA of 5 of 10, CANA of 100 or 300 milligrams. So once daily, usually we start it on a lower doses and then can go up to the higher doses. Administration is daily once, once daily. The peak plasma concentration of all of these SGLT2 inhibitors occurs within the hours, first one to two hours only. Uh, the absorption is around uh, one third to one fourth, uh, sorry, two third to uh, three fourths of them uh, are getting absorbed. And primarily all of these SGL2 uh, inhibitors are uh, excreted by glucuronidation and there's no active metabolite. So what remains the matter of fact is that the excretion, here the uh, empagliflozin is excreted half and half, 50% by hepatic mechanism, 50% by renal. And then whereas your DAPA is predominantly more than uh, three, four, three quarters is excreted by renal mechanisms, whereas your CANA predominantly gets excreted by hepatic glucuronidation. So the half-life remains the same around 12, 12 and a half, uh, 12 to 13 hours. When it comes to, again, the discussion uh, lands up again with the uh, selectivity of the SGLT2 inhibitors over SGLT1. So the selectivity of empagliflozin is 1 is to 5,000 when compared to your other DAPA or canagliflozin, and glucose excretion is almost 78 grams per day. So now coming to the scientific data, which we have uh, in the scientific literature as of now. So this is the pool data, which uh, has been uh, formed in a pictorial, uh, in a graphical, very, in a graphical uh, uh, slide here, which tells us the pool data of how 
the uh, empagliflozin acts on the uh, HbA1c reduction. So when it comes to the overall total pool data, the empagliflozin is uh, uh, 25 milligram is the red one and blue color is the 10 milligram once daily. So your HbA1c reduction overall is 0.62 to 0.68 percentage. When it, uh, when it comes to the pool data, this is the entire pool data. When it comes to the monotherapy, your 10 milligram empagliflozin reduces for 0.74, whereas your 25 milligram reduces for 0.85. When compared to metformin, the lower HbA1c reduction is seen with minus 0.64 of empagliflozin. The higher, uh, as you can see across the board, that higher empagliflozin almost causes a higher, uh, result, a higher HbA1c reduction uh, uh, as compared to the A1C. Then uh, your baseline body weight, when the whole of this uh, pool data, the baseline body weight also is uh, the entire pool data, which come, came from the phase three, four of these uh, predominant uh, main uh, phase three clinical trials. The pool data showed that the weight reduction was almost minus 0.2. And across the board, it was around 1.8 to 2 kgs in uh, patients on uh, empagliflozin 10 or 25 milligrams. Again, there has been a sig significant reduction in the uh, systolic blood pressure also, less so with that of the 10 milligram doses and more with that of the 25 milligram doses uh, in this phase three clinical data. So this is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring data of the empagliflozin. Uh, this was the baseline data of uh, patients started on 10, 25 and of those placebo. And then this is the 12 week follow up data, which showed us that there was a significant change right early uh, after 12 weeks, both in the daytime and in the nighttime. This is the normal physiological dip in the systolic blood pressure, which is seen. Even here also, you can see that there is some difference in the blood pressure readings. So the same occurred with that of the diastolic blood pressure also, the 10 milligram versus that of 25 milligram, both caused almost a sizable decline in the diastolic blood pressure also. So uh, the, when it comes to change in the lipids, uh, empagliflozin has got this uh, uh, effects on the lipids, which causes a higher level of HDL cholesterol levels, and it decreases the triglyceride level, and hence overall causing a decline in the LDL-HDL uh, cholesterol ratios, whereas your total cholesterols, yes, do they do increase your uh, levels of uh, starting the empagliflozin. So this is again a busy slide, which uh, gives us an idea of how this SGLT2 inhibitor overall, all the SGLT2 inhibitor in short, how they act on the glucose control, body weight, and the systolic blood pressure. So uh, when it comes to uh, monotherapy of empagliflozin, the HbA1c reduction was minus 1.56, with uh, fasting plasma glucose also reduced, BMI also declined to a sizable extent. So uh, when it comes to DAPA, again, the HbA1c reduction was minus 0.6 percentage, decrease in fasting plasma glucose levels, decrease in the body weight also. So when added on to metformin, it causes an A1c reduction of minus 0.5, and added on to a sulfonyl urea, it causes almost an A1c reduction of minus 0.8. Uh, with a low dose HGL2 inhibitor added on bioglitazone, PPR gamma agonist, minus 0.59, even C reduction is across the board very good for all of these agents as added as a second line of agent. So when added to a DPP-4 inhibitors, it causes almost reduction of minus 0.71. And it also acts or causes a decline in the even C when it has added to any of the drugs on the board used for uh, management of diabetes. And the best part of the story is that it does not cause any weight gain. So almost all of uh, this uh, tabular column shows us that the body weight do decline to almost two to two and a half kgs over a span of follow up. And yeah, when it comes to safety and the tolerability data of these SGLT2 inhibitors, what we can see is that uh, patients with adverse effects leading to discontinuation, be it, be it with uh, 10 milligram lower dose or the higher dose of 25 milligram, is almost around 5%. Whereas patients with uh, a serious adverse events was almost around with 10%. With any adverse agent, the size was uh, quite significant to almost uh, 70.9, predominantly being that of nausea here. So uh, the main uh, uh, the criticism or the main 
adverse event which uh, SLD2 inhibitors have been subjected is to the occurrence of urinary tract infections. Having said that, the urinary tract infections occur no more than 10% in both with uh, uh, 10 milligram or with 25 milligram uh, empagliflozin. The predominantly it is seen in female uh, patients, probably the postmenopausal women, uh, it, it is more commonly seen. Having said that, these urinary tract infections very rarely go on to cause a pyelonephritis or an urosepsis. So it is predominantly a non-complicated urinary tract infection which occurs in these patients. So there's a good uh, almost 4.7% uh, to 5% of patients having uh, your uh, genital infections. And that also is seen more commonly in the females. Volume depletion is similar across the board with uh, placebo or the empagliflozin. And uh, uh, number of uh, patients with confirmed hypoglycemic, age, hypoglycemic events is also not higher in patients with on 10 milligram or 25 milligram of empagliflozin. One point having said that to note is that the urinary tract infections are not very, very different as compared to that of the placebo. So probably it is more related to with the uncontrolled diabetes, uh, which is uh, there. Uh, the patients with diabetes per se are more prone to have urinary tract infection. So uh, the much talked of the trial is the empiric trial, empiric outcome, the empagliflozin and the cardiovascular outcome in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus and high cardiovascular risk. Anyways, Dr. Venkatesh will be dealing with the cardiovascular aspects, but briefly to tell about these things, the empiric outcome trial, the renal outcome trial, uh, there was... Uh, quite a good hazard ratio of 0.61 with incident of worsening nephropathy uh, as compared with placebo and there was also a reduction of uh, a reduction in progression to macroalbuminuria and almost half of these patients had a very good improvement in the composite renal outcome so uh, what we can safely put is that in patients with type 2 diabetes and high high cvrs empagliflozin given in addition to the standard of care, reduced heart failure hospitalization or CV death with consistent benefit observed in both those with and without heart failure at baseline. So uh, this is the empiric outcome trial, which told us that the three point maze was significant, the hazard ratio of only 0.86, and it did not, the number did not cross one, which was significant. CV death was also, uh, the hazard ratio was just 0.62. Non-fatal MI was non-significant and non-fatal stroke was also non-significant. So the point here to be taken is that the three-point maze was lower predominantly because of risk, uh, reduced risk in the heart failure hospitalization. So the benefit, this was almost a, a five-year uh, long-term follow-up data so how early these uh, benefits of empagliflozin can be seen in uh, patients started in empagliflozin? So uh, they were quite early, but how early is what has been uh, dealt in this post hoc analysis of an empiric outcome trial? This empiric outcome trial told us that reduction in the risk with empagliflozin versus placebo reached significant at day 17. Uh, for heart failure uh, hospitalization and at day 27 for benefit for heart failure hospitalization or CV death. So what we can uh, safely assume is that the benefits of the cardiac benefits are seen as early as less than a month. But, and also with the benefit on CV death reach significance for the first time at the day 59. So all in all over a span of two to uh, less than two to three months, we can safely conclude that the effects on the cardiovascular benefit does set in or does start to act in. So uh, next coming to this MPRI study, which was uh, the effectiveness and safety of empagliflozin in routine care patients as compared to that of DPP-4 inhibitors. One of the, again, very potent and a very uh, safer class of uh, anti-diabetic medicines, anti-diabetic medications we can put on, which looked into 30, almost 40,000 of mass tests. So what it told us is that it gave us the almost, again, the similar picture that your heart failure hospitalizations decreased significantly, whereas the uh, rate with myocardial infarction or stroke per se MI 
humor in ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke also were no different from that of TPP4 inhibitor and the all cause mortality was better in patients with empagliflozin. So these early findings from MPRIZE uh, showed us that empagliflozin was associated with a decrease in the risk of heart failure hospitalization and a similar risk of MI or stroke in routine clinical care as compared to that of DPP4. And in a subset of population wherein we had the mortality data, which also told that it causes a decreased risk of all-cause mortality compared with DPP4 inhibitor. This has been the, uh, the track record of how the CVOTs have been performing. Post the rosiglitazone controversy, FDA wanted CVOT trial for all of the anti-diabetic medications uh, to prove that they are cardiovascular, cardiovascular safety, to prove the medication's cardiovascular safety. So CVOTs are required post that uh, ROSI uh, controversy. So what we can see is that the data started coming in from 2013, whereas uh, tons of loads of data started poured in 2000. 17 and 18, predominantly of that of Canvas and uh, uh, Credence trial data came in, Carmelina and Carolina in the late 2018-19 data, Declared to me came in 2019, and Ertugliflozin data is still awaited. So what does the guideline tell now? So the, even the 2018 ADA ESD consensus report tells that Probably metformin is not necessarily considered as a first line drug therapy. In drug nine patients who have been detected to have uh, diabetes uh, very recently and who have not received any drugs, so and who have got an established ACVD or have a high or a very high cardiovascular disease risk, you can start upfront with or uh, an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP1 receptor analog because of it proven cardiovascular benefits which are seen. So to conclude, uh, uh, this is how the, the, uh, there occurs a variety of uh, mechanisms, there occurs a variety of now indications also for the use of empagliflozin. So I have taken briefly through all these uh, pivotal studies and also the empiric outcome, the renal, uh, renal uh, benefits. Uh, so if you have any questions, please reach out to me after the session. We'll have a post uh, session uh, question and answers, or you can also email me at the uh, email ID. I'm Dr. Basavra JS. I'm located at Narayana Health City, Bangalore, Department of Diabetes and Endocrinology. I can hand it over to Dr. Shovik. Over to you, Dr. Shovik. Thank you. I think, uh, Dr. Venkatesh, I think you can. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Vasavraj, for your excellent presentation. So, the next, our next presenter will start the presentation. So, Dr. Venkatesh. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Allow me to share my screen. Uh, well, that was a wonderful uh, talk from uh, Dr. Vasavraj. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes, yes, sir. You can make it a full screen, sir. Yes, yes, fine. Fantastic. So, uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, we learned a lot about uh, empagliflozin from Dr. Basavraj. And uh, today I take you through a cardiologist perspective of uh, this molecule, which initially set off to be a molecule to be predominantly used for the management of diabetes, but surprisingly turned out to be extremely beneficial for the cardiologists as well. So we already went through some of the presentation that uh, Dr. Basraj took us through. And uh, we know now very well that uh, the exploratory data which showed that SGLT2 inhibitors have multiple cardiorenal benefits. So if you can see, the SGLT2 inhibitors, basically empagliflozin, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and artugliflozin. Artugliflozin, of course, we haven't heard much about it. But these three molecules, DAPA, CANA, and EMPA, and their respective influences on hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death, and kidney outcome. You can see that 
in the EMPAREG outcome trial, when you look at empagliflozin, the numbers are really good compared to the others. Yeah, 35, 33, 38, 32, 39, 40, 47. So you can see here that except for this 47, which comes for dapagliflozin in the declared TME58 trial, very impressive numbers turn out with empagliflozin molecule with a statistically significant benefit in terms of hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death, and kidney outcome. This again is the EMPAREG outcome trial. And you can see here that when they studied the three-point maze, the cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, and death from any cause, you could really see some stunning, statistically significant benefits in terms of cardiovascular death and death from any cause, and all the more for hospitalization for heart failure. And empagliflozin was definitely a better thing to be used compared to a placebo. And this is what the EMPAREG outcome trial showed us. Well, let's see what the Framingham Heart Study, the good old study has made us understand as far as diabetes and heart failure was concerned. You could see in this very, uh, you know, landmark trial, that the risk of cardiovascular disease events by age and sex, when they mapped it for men and women, you could see the tallest bars here and that's for cardiac failure. So there's a very high rate of heart failure in patients with diabetes over a 30 year follow-up. So most of the patients with diabetes can be expected to develop cardiac failure. And of course, the next of course is probably peripheral vascular disease and then the coronary artery disease. And let me remind you, that one of the most important causes for a heart failure in a diabetic is again a coronary artery disease. So heart failure is a more common outcome than myocardial infarction, stroke, and death in diabetes trials. And these are the various trials that have proved that this is what actually happens in diabetes. Now, when you look at the more intensive versus less intensive control uh, and compare each of them, in various trials like the Accord, Advanced, UKPDS, VA, DD. With respect to myocardial infarction and admission for heart failure, you can clearly see that most of the dots or the squares that you see, except for the Accord trial, they are all to the left of the midline, which means it favors more intensive control. In other words, you have a good control of diabetes, a more intensive control of diabetes, then the possibility of the patient developing a myocardial infarction or admission to the hospital or getting into a fatal heart failure situation is definitely much less. So an intensive control is supposed to be beneficial. So the heart failure outcomes in clinical trials of glucose lowering agents in patients with diabetes, according to the various trials, when you put the graph here and put it in a very um, understandable way, you can see here that this MPAREG here. And if you see the square in the MPAREG is the one which is low down compared to the other squares here. So this is a landmark trial. The EMPAREG trial with the SGLT2 inhibitor seems to score over other molecules like DPP4 inhibitors, GLP-1 agonist TZT, insulin, and sulfonylureas. So this is the impressive study. That's why we call the SGLT2 inhibitor trials as the landmark trials in the management of heart failure. So you can clearly see that when you use this molecule, especially SGLT2, the empagliflozin in this clearly trial showed that the hazard ratio was definitely beneficial. So what is this evidence of benefit of SGLT2 inhibitors and heart failure risk in patients with diabetes? This is called the empiric outcome. Now, what did they do? They screened about 11,531 patients and randomized and treated about 7,020 patients. And they were actually randomized to three arms, one the placebo, where about 2,000 and odd got the placebo, and about 2,345 got EMPA-10, and then EMPA-25 was given in the other 2,342. And what is the inclusion criteria? Please remember that this was a secondary prevention trial kind of a situation where a patient had type 2 diabetes mellitus and established cardiovascular disease. And of these, about 10% had heart failure at baseline. This is something that one should pay attention to. And of course, the BMI was less than 45, HbA1c 7 to 10, and EGFR was more than 30 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square surface. This was the inclusion criteria that was there in the empiric outcome. And what did they find? A 
heart failure outcomes in clinical trials of glucose lowering agents in patients with diabetes clearly showed that hemagliflozin. And you can see the divergence of the curve is beginning very, very early, even less than a month. You can see that compared to placebo, hemagliflozin scores and reduces the number of events. The SGLT2 inhibitors affect multiple pathophysiological aspects, basically in the heart and in the kidney. And in the kidney, it's basically the natriuresis, which improves, I'm sorry, natriuresis, which happens. And of course, the improved kidney function and cardiorenal physiology happens when you use SGLT2 inhibitors. And when you look at the heart, you can see a reduced preload and afterload, and therefore a reduction in LV wall stress. And there is also a reduction of interstitial edema. The myocardial interstitial edema is also reduced, which probably contributes to the benefit that it has in terms of heart failure. Now, uh, this was this is a very, very important uh, slide. And uh, uh, this was something uh, which happened in uh, 2016. And uh, a very thought-provoking slide. I thought uh, I would share the slide with you. Look at the way they have classified the various drugs for heart failure and what it means in terms of evolution in progress. If you look at therapies that only prevent heart failure, statins, BP control, calcium channel blockers and thiazides, SGLT2 inhibitors, and questionable antiplatelets, weight loss, primary prevention. Therapies that only treated established heart failure, ARNI, ivabradin, and implantation of certain devices called the CIT device and the ICD device and the mineral receptor antagonist, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. And therapies that both treat and prevent were AC inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, and exercise. Now, this is a very, very thought provoking slide, but remember, this is an old slide. It comes from 2016. Now, does this mean that SGLT2 inhibitor should only be used to prevent heart failure? Now, this is the gamut of today's talk, and we're going to see that this has changed. What we thought in 2016 is becoming irrelevant. Now, SGLT2 inhibitors will occupy a place in the third column where it not only prevents heart failure, but it also is used to treat heart failure. And as we go along, we'll see that happening. Even in the guidelines, if you can see, the 2019 ESC guidelines and the 2019 ACCHA practical guidelines talk to us that when a patient has got ASCVD, then we start with or add an SGLT2 inhibitor or a GLP-1 receptor. So this is one thing that has come out clearly in the 2019 guidelines. In the 2019 guidelines, ACC AHA, you can see here in patients with other cardiovascular diseases, risk factors like primary prevention, you can use SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1A. So primary prevention to prevent hospitalization for heart failure, you can use this molecule. But is that all? Can we use it as a treatment for heart failure is something that we need to see now as we go along. This comes the emperor heart failure studies. Now, emperor heart failure studies are basically um, two studies, emperor reduced trial and emperor preserved trial. Now, what is this emperor reduced trial? And you can see that this is something that has been presented in the most recent European Society of Cardiology virtual meeting. And you can see that this is the distinction between emperor reduced trial and emperor preserved trial. If it is an emperor reduced, reduced means what is reduced? The ejection fraction is reduced to less than 40%. Then these are the patients who come into the emperor reduced trial. If the patient is having an ejection fraction of more than 40%, then he comes into something called as the emperor preserved trial, which is preserved ejection fraction. So there are certain strict protocols that have been laid down with respect to emperor reduced and emperor preserved. And you also not only look at the ejection fraction of less than 40%, but you also look at elevated NT pro BNP levels. And here are the cutoffs values that have been given for patients with atrial fibrillation and without atrial fibrillation. Obviously, for patients with atrial fibrillation, the values are higher, cutoff values are higher. And the upper appropriate dose of medical therapy. Remember, the standard of care has already been there. AC inhibitors, ARB, beta blockers, oral diuretics, mineral corticoid receptor antagonists, ARNI, evabridin, all these have been used. And on top of that, you have used empagliflozin. Please remember that. So very strict, very well carried out trial. And Emperor Preserved again had its own value for NT pro BNP, which was more than 300 for patients without AF and 900 for patients with AF. 
And they also had this echocardiogram, which showed presence of structural heart disease in terms of left atrial enlargement and or left ventricular hypertrophy. And if there was a hospitalization for heart failure with, within 12 months prior to screening, then they were the ones that were included in the study. So you could clearly see a distinction happening between an ejection fraction of less than 40% versus an ejection fraction of more than 40% with the accompanying anti-pro BNP value and also echocardiographic criteria. So this was the important study called the Emperor study, which was carried out. Now, the Emperor Reserve study and the Emperor Reduce study, when you look at this, look at the large number of participants here, 5,988 participants in the Emperor Reserve study. We are awaiting the results of the study. The study is ongoing. And Emperor Reduce study, where the ejection fraction is less than 40%, where either empagliflozin 10 milligram was compared to a placebo, the same thing here again. And the follow-up is for 20 months here, and it's an ongoing study with a follow-up of 24 months here. And again, the post-treatment period is 30 days, and the post-treatment period here is 30 days. So almost like a comparative um, uh, study that's going on. We have, we have to see how uh, we're going to come up with emperor preserved study and what would be its results. But when you look at the emperor reduced, uh, reduced uh, study, you can see here that uh, uh, it was wonderful. As before that, I would like to just emphasize on this emperor trials. You can see that number of uh, countries across continents were included in the study. The Asia Pacific, the Europe, the North America, Latin America, Australia and South Africa have been uh, the various countries have been included and even India has been a part of the Emperor trial. And uh, the design and rationale of the Emperor trials of empagliflozin uh, in chronic heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, this is called the Emperor preserved trials. Uh, it was basically uh, to see how this molecule would do in the presence of preserved ejection fraction and the left ventricular ejection fraction is more than 40%. Now, having said that, let us uh, go to the, uh, you know, the European Heart Journal of uh, European Journal of Heart Failure in 2019 has published this Emperor Reduced Trial data, and uh, October 2019 has been uh, the uh, month of publication. And uh, basically, uh, this was a trial to see by adjusting eligibility based on natriuretic peptide levels to baseline injection fraction, uh, high risk patients get enclosed, and we can see here that uh, a substantial number of patients in this trial had an ejection fraction of less than 30%. Please remember that as the ejection fraction gets worse, the event rate goes up. So if the ejection fraction is less than 30%, the event rate is expected to be at least 15%. And that's exactly the reason we say that in many conditions, heart failure is worse than many types of cancers. At least you can expect a cancer patient to live for those five years. But if a patient has got heart failure and his ejection fraction is less than 30% and you have an annual event rate of about 15%. So at the end of five years, I think you will only have about one in four patients of heart failure surviving and coming to you for follow-up. And that's how deadly heart failure is. So we need to have all the molecules, all good molecules to, you, to be used to reduce this kind of an event rate. So there, are, there may be a lot of mechanisms which are responsible for the cardioprotective effect of these GLG-2 inhibitors as shown in the uh, Emparag trial. And uh, these are the various ways. If people are interested, they can go into it and inhibit activation of calcium, carbamodulin, and, and there's so many theories. There are so many um, uh, mechanisms which have been studied. Uh, although the exact single mechanism uh, is still not uh, elucidated, but uh, the beneficial effect of uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors have been uh, uh, really expounded very well as far as the clinical benefit is concerned. And uh, they may uh, probably slow the course of cardiomyocyte injury and loss of uh, and loss by inhibiting the sodium hydrogen exchanger in the myocardium. So, so many such theories are uh, coming up as far as the beneficial effect of uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are concerned. But please remember that this was basically set out to be a molecule to be used for uh, reducing the HbA1c levels uh, in diabetes, and that's how it started off. 
And then finally, when we got into the game, we found that it was giving a lot of cardiovascular benefits. So uh, the emperor reduced uh, top line results was uh, actually uh, published. And uh, you could see here that the composite primary endpoint and time to first event of adjudicated cardiovascular death or adjudicated hospitalization for heart failure in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with a time frame of up to 38 months was studied. And the composite primary endpoint is time to first event of adjudicated cardiovascular death or adjudicated hospitalization for heart failure in patients with reduced ejection fraction was also looked at. So this was the article that uh, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, carried out uh, with respect to the emperor study. And you can see here that it was not only cardiovascular, but it was also a study of the renal outcomes, which happened with in heart failure. So the ESC Congress 2020, of course, this time it was all a digital experience because of the COVID situation. And on the Saturday, 29th August, 2020, uh, there was a hotline session and uh, the emperor reduced uh, trial was uh, uh, kind of uh, brought into light in terms of uh, its uh, wonderful uh, benefits with uh, Milton Packer from USA uh, being the presenter. And what did it basically tell us? The emperor reduced trial specified only three endpoints to be tested in a hierarchical manner. One is the primary endpoint. It was a composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Because clinically, we know that patients with diabetes die due to heart failure or have a cardiovascular death. So this was a molecule which was to be studied against the SCANS context. And therefore, the primary endpoint was a composite of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. Then came the secondary endpoint, which were basically two. What were, this, what were the two uh, secondary endpoints. The first one was a total heart failure hospitalization. That is the first hospitalization and recurrent hospitalization. That was the first secondary endpoint. And the second secondary endpoint was the slope of decline in glomerular filtration rate over time. And that's exactly the reason why I said even the renal outcomes were looked at in the Empire trial. So there has been a contribution to science and literature with respect to the emperor reduced trial showing that hemoglobin is superior to placebo in improving heart failure outcomes among patients with symptomatic stable heart failure with reduced ejection fraction with the EF of less than 40% on excellent baseline guideline directed medical therapy irrespective of, of diabetes status. I think this is important to understand irrespective of diabetes status, whether he's a diabetic or he's not a diabetic, a Dimparic trial set out to prove a point that when you give this molecule on top of guideline directed medical therapy, it was superior to a placebo. And the goal of the trial was to assess the safety also and efficacy of empagliflozin in patients with symptomatic heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, again, irrespective of diabetes status. It proved not only the safety and efficacy of the molecule, but it also told us about the adverse effects and how safe the molecule is to be used clinically. And this again, I have already uh, mentioned this, but this is more narrative. So you can see that there were about 7,220 patients who were screened and about 3,730 were the number of enrollees. In 16 months, median was the follow-up and the patient average age was 67 years and of which 24% were females. And the inclusion criteria, of course, age more than 18 years, chronic heart failure who had NYHA function class two, three, or four, ejection fraction of less than 40%, heart failure hospitalization within 12 months, and the NT-pro uh, NT BNP values you could see here um, was more than 600 if EF is less than 30%, and more than 1,000 if the EF is between 31, 31 to 35%, and more than 2,500 if EF is more than 35%, for people who had a concomitant atrial fibrillation, you just doubled the thresholds. So this was a very good inclusion criteria to study patients with heart failure with the ejection fraction of less than 40%. You also had some very good exclusion criteria, which were very strict. Acute coronary syndrome, stroke, or EIS within 90 days were excluded from the study. 
but patients who had established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and who were stable were included in the study. Those who were listed for heart transplantation or who had a LVSS device, of course, we don't use them because they are already on other forms of treatment for heart failure. Cardiomyopathy based on infiltrative or accumulative diseases, muscular dystrophies, reversible causes, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restrictive pericardial uh, diseases, peripartum cardiomyopathy caused by chemotherapy with, within uh, 12 months, valvular heart disease, acute decompensated heart failure, and if a patient has undergone ICD or CRT within three months as a device therapy for heart failure, were excluded because they were already getting non-pharmacological management and that would have confounded the results and therefore these patients with devices were excluded from the study. Well, these are the other salient features, characteristics, and if you can see here, the estimated GFR, this is one thing I'm interested in, about 48% of the people had an eGFR of less than 60. So you could see that about 50% of the patients had an eGFR of less than 60. And uh, the primary outcome, cardiovascular death or heart failure, heart failure hospitalization for empagliflozin versus placebo was 19.4 versus 24.6 percent and heart failure hospitalization 13.2 percent versus 18.3 percent. So you could see here in a very graphical way that SGLT2 inhibitors with empagliflozin is effective for diabetes. And look at what happens to the primary endpoint. And remember, the primary endpoint was hospitalization for heart failure. And we're most worried about these two things, heart failure admission, and he can die because of that, and a cardiovascular cause of, of his death. And if you can see what empagliflozin does, when you add empagliflozin to percent reduction in the risk, now tell me which molecule gives you that on top of guideline-directed medical therapy. And if you look at the secondary endpoint, First of all, the first and recurrent heart failure hospitalization, it reduces by 30%. And these are statistically significant, my friends. And look at the renal outcome. The slope of decline in GFR over time is reduced by 50%. So this is something which is really good for the clinician and to tell the patient and substantiate as to why he wants to start empagliflozin in such situation to keep the patient safe. So these are all, again, the same thing what I said, but in a more graphical manner. Um, empagliflozin prevented both serious heart failure and serious kidney failure events. And this is a, a graph which shows early divergence because your patient may ask you, doctor, how soon should I start at this molecule? And your answer would be as soon as possible. Why? Because you can see a very early divergence of curves that happens when you start empagliflozin. So empagliflozin reduces cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure in a statistically significant manner. And of course, the kidney really benefits because as we know, all these days, we did not have anything, no other molecule apart from AC inhibitors and AR base. They were not really very good molecules, which slowed down the progression of chronic kidney disease. And uh, eventually one had to wait for some form of renal replacement therapy. So the parameters that was studied were something like doubling of creatinine and eventually of requiring a renal transplant or a, renal, a, a dialysis. It um, preserved the renal function and stretch the time that was required to actually go in for this definitive therapies. That is where the role of SGLT2 inhibitors really come. So emperor reduced trial has major implications for clinical practice. emperor reduced trial with empagliflozin will have definitely uh, uh, a, a major impact in our practice in terms of treatment for patients with chronic heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, irrespective of the fact that they have, whether they have diabetes or uh, they don't have diabetes. And this is what I have been emphasizing all along. It set out that SGLT2 inhibitors were molecules to reduce the HbA1c. It started off as anti-diabetic drugs. But where do we have got now? Irrespective of whether they have diabetes or not, 
in patients who have reduced ejection fraction when you use them on top of standard care of a uh, standard guideline directed medical care you will definitely have much better benefits both cardiac as well as renal so there is no compelling evidence that sglt2 inhibitor should be added to currently recommended treatments for this disease so you can see here that both primary and secondary cardiovascular outcomes have definitely been impacted by the use of this molecule hospitalization for heart failure and death from any cause not only the cardiovascular death of course cardiovascular death it's proved beyond doubt but even death from any cause sglt2 inhibitors have an impact and still we do not know the exact way in which the sglt2 inhibitors are giving us this benefit but however of course as i said probably their beneficial effect on interstitial edema and then some kind of benefit on the myocardium reduction of afterload reduction of preload natriuresis which happens reduction in weight we don't know but however there are so many mechanisms probably not one but many and therefore we use to see this as a clinical benefit so emperor uh, reduced effect on individual components of the primary endpoint i i think this is again some kind of a graphical representation to impress upon all of us that look this molecule is really good in terms of primary composite outcomes cardiovascular death and the hospitalization for heart failure and there again you can see that there is a divergence of curve at the very beginning in terms of total hospitalization for heart failure so the earlier you use them the better it is for the patient as far as the safety is concerned i think related to cardiac disorder and related to the worsening of renal function when you compared empagliflozin to placebo you could see that empagliflozin uh, did no uh, i mean was definitely not having much adverse events as compared to placebo in fact placebo group had more adverse events and empagliflozin had much less uh, adverse events so you could clearly see here that uh, the except for one where you have this urinary tract infection uh, and volume depletion these two things uh, of course volume depletion leads to a little bit of hypotension so this is one place where probably there was a little bit of superiority over uh, um over the placebo and uh, it caused a little bit of a, a problem but uh, uh, there are been uh, uh, quite uh, if you look at the limb amputations because people talk of limb amputation when you use uh, sglt2 inhibitors but when you look at the emperor trial you could see that it really was not different it was 13 here and 10 here remember they were used in diabetics with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease established already this was the subset high risk patients were included in the study and it was obvious that they would probably have some amount of peripheral vascular disease so this again is a conclusion slide of this empiric trial and you can see here that uh, statistically significant reduction in terms of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure happened with empagliflozin 10 mg and again the renal outcome if you can see statistically significant value of egfr decline that happened so very benefit a lot of benefit that you get out of uh, using this molecule so this again is the same thing in terms of number here you studied something called as composite renal outcome now what is this composite renal outcome it's chronic hemodialysis renal transplantation and profound sustained reduction in egfr so you could see all of them getting affected in a very favorable manner when you used empagliflozin so the results of this trial indicate that empagliflozin is superior to placebo in improving heart failure outcomes and among patients with symptomatic stable heart failure with reduced ejection fraction on excellent guideline directed medical therapy irrespective of diabetes status benefit is primarily driven by reduction in heart failure hospitalization benefit in renal outcomes very very impressive and this is a very important landmark trial and mirror similar findings from the napa hf trial for dapagliflozin and as we know fda has already improved dapagliflozin in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and as we already saw in empiric trial even patients with severe lv dysfunction where the ejection fraction was less than 30% appeared to benefit from the trial and even though sglt2 inhibitors were introduced as diabetic management drugs the results of the empiric outcome trial and others indicated a clear benefit in heart failure management this trial enrolled a dedicated heart failure population 
and it conclusively showed a benefit in this patient population, irrespective of diabetes status. And these drugs will likely have a prominent role in future heart failure management guidelines. So this is uh, something that uh, we are looking at. We are waiting for the emperor preserved trials and uh, we hope that uh, a nice uh, benefit is coming with the molecule empagliflozin in the patient population who have an ejection fraction of more than 40%. We all know that in patients with diastolic heart failure, predominant diastolic heart failure, we have very little options at our command. And most of the patients of diastolic heart failure are just treated like patients with uh, uh, systolic heart failure. And there are no, as of now, uh, any uh, dramatic molecules to change the outcomes in a very uh, impressive way. So we are waiting for this uh, result of the Emperor Preserved trial. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of speculated uh, mechanisms that are uh, being suggested. If the Emperor Preserved trial really shows benefit, then uh, it could be due to all these kinds of uh, mechanisms which have been proposed here, like reduced cardiac preload or a shift to uh, ketone metabolism and then adaptive cellular reprogr reprogramming and the sodium hydrogen exchange inhibition that is actually one of the basis of uh, the way the SGLT molecule acts. And uh, of course, improvement in the endothelial function and reduced uh, cardiac uh, fibrosis. So we still uh, have all these kind of uh, uh, mechanisms that have been attributed to the beneficial effect of SGLT2 inhibitors and the emperor preserved trial outcome is expected in 2021 probably the first half of 2021. And every one of us are eagerly uh, looking to the outcome of this emperor uh, preserved trial. And let's hope that it will deliver almost um, a similar kind of benefit for patients with preserved ejection fraction as already been shown by the emperor reduced trial for patients with ejection fraction of uh, less than uh, 40%. And uh, again, it's the same repetition here. Um, the empagliflozin at ESC 2020, they had a evolving research and insights where effect of empagliflozin versus placebo on body composition in patients with acute myocardial infarction and type 2 diabetes mellitus, a subgroup analysis of the N-body trial, and then effect of empagliflozin as add-on therapy on transtubular potassium concentration. All these were papers which are presented in the ESC 2020 digital conference. And uh, they went on to study empagliflozin on arterial stiffness, endothelial function, and ventricular arterial coupling in type 2 diabetes mellitus, a one-year follow-up. And there have been uh, a lot of uh, studies that are going on, sub-studies that are going on with respect to this molecule, and which have been uh, uh, a kind of an evolving research and more insight into this molecule. So with this, uh, I thank you for uh, patient listening. And uh, I am open to any questions uh, from all of you. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think I stopped sharing my screen. Yes. Uh, uh, okay. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Basavra, there's a question from the audience. Do you think after this emperor HF trial, uh, does empagliflozin uh, may be considered as par with the metformin? Uh, do you think after which trial? Emperor HF trial. Do you think after this emperor HF trial, the empagliflozin can be considered as par with metformin or maybe a better drug than metformin? Emperor HF is related to heart failure, so probably when he's speaking to diabetes... No, sir, in non-diabetic in diabetic patients, yes. Yeah, when it comes to uh, diabetic patients, probably in patients with heart failure, yeah. definitely empagliflozin yeah. uh, stands at par at least with metformin, if not superior. Mm -hmm. So probably I would I would uh, stay cautious in uh, labeling it as superior to metformin because metformin is quite, quite a old drug which has been time tested and which has been there quite long with no major adverse events occurring. So at least I would tell that it comes at par with level of heart failure. Uh, 
uh, at in in uh, when talking to relation with uh, diabetes management at least uh, in comparison to that of uh, metformin okay fine uh, dr venkatesh yeah. there is a question okay uh, just a moment the question has come can we prescribe aglt2 inhibitor in patients without established cvd or having multiple cvd factors oh yes uh, we now looked at the empareg trial which was basically a study which uh, included diabetic patients with ascvd now if you look at the other sglt2 trials uh you could see here that uh, there were a large populations which benefited almost in a similar way without ascvd in terms of reduction of heart failure in terms of the renal benefit so definitely yes you can use this molecule without any hesitation definitely yes okay you have and to go through the other trials that's all uh, yes. today we focused on the empareg trial but if you are looking okay. at the canvas trial and then the dapa trials if you can look at them if you look at the populations that have been studied yes. you can see that there have been primary prevention data on that okay so fine there is no more question sir so we are concluding the session and thank you dr venkatesh dr basavras for your wonderful presentation and sharing your practical experiences by answering our audience and we'll see in the future meeting thank you very much sir thank you so much thank you for giving this wonderful opportunity and uh, all the best to you and to your team and uh, yeah. i think this morning we're just waiting for this emperor uh, preserved trial data to preserved come trial. out yeah, yes, yes, yes. very very exciting trial yeah. once we have them i think the uh the it will be a revolution probably and a milestone yes. in the management of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction we're all looking forward to that thank you yeah thank you yes. thank you all thank you thank you thank you thank you bye thank you